Uh, we are continuing our series. This is the eighth week. Can you believe it? This is the eighth week of our nine-week series on hot topics. And today we're going to be talking about race and racism and our biblical response to that. Um, I am have our good friend, my uncle, Melissa's uncle, uh, he's going to be sharing the word with us. I'm going to introduce him here in just a moment. Uh, but I do want to just give you a quick word about next week. I'm going to be talking about sexuality next week. And I want you to come ready to receive. Uh, it has been a to topic I've been working uh, really hard on. Uh, lots of uh, amazing resource time in the word. But we're going to be talking about Christ-centered sexuality. What does that mean for us as believers? What does this mean as far as how do we respond to a world where sexuality is a bit more fluid? Where sexuality is a bit more confusing? We're going to talk about what does God's word say about the area of sexuality? How do we respond as a church? with both grace and truth in a loving way in response to a world that is looking for answers. And so I want you to come ready to receive next week. Uh, it will be a little bit of an extended service time, uh, not terribly long. So for all of you who are looking at your watches, you know who you are. It's not going to be terribly long. We'll still get you out, here, out of here in time to go grab lunch but hopefully leaving you with a significant challenge. Hopefully leaving you with something to think about, something to pray about, and something to continue to live by. Amen? Well, I, I am so thankful. We call him Uncle Ken. And, uh, and he has been a blessing in my life personally. He's been a mentor. Uh, he has uh, been a a good godly challenge in my life and a place of encouragement. Uh, Ken Harvey is married to a wonderful lady, the better half, Kathy Harvey, and, uh, and as Aunt Kathy to Melissa. And, and so, yes, she had to put up with Melissa when she was little. Uh, and, uh, but we are so thankful for their ministry. We're thankful for their love in our family. Um, but I'm really thankful f in particular for Ken's testimony. I'm so thankful f that he is a man of God who has an incredible perspective on this area of topic on race and racism and how do we biblically respond to those things. And so I would love for you to give a warm welcome to Ken as he takes time to share this morning. Good morning, Turning Point. I want to do a quick thank you to Josh for, um, and Melissa for their invitation to be here with you this weekend. And I want to do a quick shout out to Monty and, and Amy Jo. I just wanted to let you know that we're praying for you. And we love you and we care about what's happened and what you're going through as the rest of your family here does. I want to do a shout out to uh, a, a co-worker of mine from a number of years who is a member of this congregation, Teresa Gass, who I understand is part of the online uh, church uh, this morning. And I also want to do a shout out to the saints of Open Bible who knew Kathy and me way back when we were part of this church. That was a few years ago. Uh, before it was called Turning Point, when it was located in another location. And, but uh, thank you for your love for us back then. Do you remember the prayer that Jesus prayed just before Gethsemane? If you do, let's, let's just go immediately to the Word of God and in the Gospel of John and the, in the New Testament... In chapter 17, we find Jesus 
with his followers at the conclusion of the Passover meal. And this is just before Jesus is going to be arrested, beaten, crucified, and then entombed. Beginning in verse 20, he prays, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Not his word, but their word. In verse 21, he says that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you love me. How many of you have ever had a deep tissue massage? That's where you don't just feel the sweet flutter of fingertips just gliding over your skin, but a deep, painful pushing of knuckles and elbows to help touch those muscle groups and separate the muscle fibers and get to the knots of muscles. And it pries them apart, helps to break down those knots. And it's a massage that's meant to move past surface issues and get to the deeper things that are bothering you. Well, I was recently the recipient of, or maybe I should say the victim of a deep tissue massage. And as I lay there struggling to breathe through the pain and groaning in pain, the, um, the massage practitioner reminded me while I was squealing that I was actually there because I had asked for it. <laughs> and he reminded me that what he was inflicting on me was actually good pain that was meant to help take care of the bad pain. And to say it hurt was an understatement, but it really helped. And it really helped take care of some issues that I had going on in my back. So I can't say that I enjoyed it, but I can say that it helped and that I was better for it. And today I'm here essentially as your spiritual deep tissue massage practitioner. <laughs> In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6, it reads that the Lord disciplines or chastens those he loves. And depending upon your version of the scriptures that you use, the, the key word there might be discipline, it might be uh, chastening, it might be scourging, it might be punishing, but it essentially tells us that no discipline is joyous at the time it's being given, but it leads to good outcomes. And so I think this morning, the word deep tissue massage can be inserted into that verse. And so we could say that no deep tissue massage for the moment seems enjoyable, but there are good outcomes from it. Back when Josh was a wee little lad and 
Melissa was in grade school. Monty and I both had full heads of hair. <laughs> and we were gathered in the sanctuary, the First Church Open Bible, and we were singing a song that, um, along with the other saints, raising our hands and singing, He is our peace, who has broken down every wall. He is our peace. He is our peace. You know, a portion of that song uh, comes from the second chapter of the book of Ephesians, where Paul makes a beautiful, wonderful declaration that Jesus, our Lord, our Christ, and Messiah is our peace. And he has made both one by what? By breaking down the wall between us. That he was reconciling us both to God into one body. And by one body, he was meaning the body of Christ, his bride. And how did he do that? Through the cross. And he put to death the hostility that was between us. Now, Paul is referring in that scripture to Jews and Gentiles. But let's, let's consider that he, he could have been talking about us and them. Us and them. So this morning, are you an us or are you a them? Which are you? The person who's sitting behind you or in front of you, are they an us or are they a them? You know, being identified as an us or a them perhaps ought not matter, but it does. Because if I'm treated as a them, I can feel it. I know it. And so do you. Quick show of hands. Have you ever been considered a them? Has someone ever treated you as a them? Raise your hand. And this is one of the reasons why I told Josh when he, he invited me to come and speak with you that I, I wouldn't just confine it to skin color. Because I think every one of us in here has had a situation where we felt and were treated like a them. This, this issue was addressed by the Apostle Peter when he received a vision where the animals were lowered from the sky in a sheet. And, and the Spirit said to him, rise, Peter, slay and eat. And Peter was actually disgusted because there was no way, and he said to God, no way, I am not going to kill and eat some of those icky animals in that sheet. But Peter was, he learned that the Lord was not really just, was not really talking about animals in that vision. He was trying to get Peter to understand that it was time for Peter to let go of the notion of us and them. That, that he, as a Jew, was somehow superior and better than Gentiles, than those who were not Jews. It was time for him to stop considering them as others. It was time for him to stop seeing himself as superior to them. 
Peter was not free to choose to refuse to associate with them. So then what about us? Are we free to choose to refuse? There's another word in that that portion in Ephesians that is the word reconciling. And I'm wondering if I'm the only one here who doesn't really use the word reconciling in my daily conversation. And I think that we're often challenged to even consider putting reconciling into practice, in our, into our daily practice. When is the last time you chose to reconcile? Just yesterday? Or what about the day before? Well, this word reconciling comes from a, the root word consiling. So reconciling or conciliating. And it's really about removing the aversion to someone else, removing the hostility between individuals. It means bringing them together or uniting. And that's one of the things that makes that portion of Scripture in Ephesians so powerful, that Jesus did that for us and with us. He reconciled us to God, but he also reconciled us to each other. Or at least he was supposed to do that. Church congregations really are supposed to be places where the reconciled come together, gather together, can fellowship together, can worship together, can sing and praise the Lord together. It's a place where we can come and be together because we have overcome or set aside or had something that's bridged the differences between us. No longer hostile, no longer strangers and enemies to each other. So the question is, has the cross and the blood of Yeshua the Messiah been enough to truly reconcile us? Has it been enough in your life to reconcile you to others or to make you want to, want to be consiled to others? He is our peace, who has broken down some walls, right? Some walls? What? Every wall. Every wall. Every wall. So there's no longer an us and a them. There's no longer supposed to be those I want to be with and those I don't want to be with in the body of Christ, in the Spokane community, in Turning Point Church. Because Christ and our gratitude for what he's done for us, for loving Someone as flawed as me, someone as flawed as, oh, I can't accuse you of being as flawed as me, but it should be enough for me to then be ready and willing and happy to accept someone else into my life because he accepted me. So the question is, has the grace and mercy and the forgiveness that we have found at the cross and in the arms of Jesus been enough to make us want to 
grant mercy and grace to someone else, to grant forgiveness to someone else. And you might say, well, yes, if they deserve it. Did I deserve it? I didn't. the love of God been enough to make me want to love anyone else? And has the Spirit of God that we were singing about filling us, Spirit of God, come and fill us, has that taken away my own germophobia? My own germophobia which keeps me from reaching out and touching someone who I think is icky. That makes me want to keep my distance from someone who is distasteful. Is it enough? It should be. Has it enabled me to stop thinking that I am better? That I'm superior? Has it made me more caring? Has it made me more loving? I wonder. You know, I want to share something with you. I'm not really a black person. I was glad as a teenager to sing the song Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. But I wasn't really black because really I'm a butterscotch American. <laughs> and to, to do some checking, I decided to take a DNA test a number of years ago and in the DNA test discovered that Sure enough, I am butterscotch American. That I have ancestors who, yes, came from different parts of Africa, but some of them also came from different parts of Europe. Some of them came from different parts of Asia. Some of them came from this place or that place, and I discovered that some of my people came from some of the places where your people came from. And so what does that make me? And what does that make you? It makes us all part of the human race. Ultimately, we are one family. And if we didn't share the blood of Jesus Christ, we would still be one family because we came from one family. And in the end, in the end of all things, we're gonna be one family again. So, it is time for us to, be, to begin to stop allowing the enemy to separate us based upon color, based upon um, where we're from, based upon how much money we have or don't have. We are supposed to be one family. You know, I've been reading some books recently and I think that they've been, they've, the list is available to you if you wanna take a look at them. So I'm not going to go through all of their names, but it's a very interesting uh, list of, of books and, and reference materials that I had, had available to me. And what I can tell you is they essentially indicate that human beings are always looking for reasons to feel better about themselves by thinking they're better than someone else.
And I can tell you, the Lord doesn't like it. The Lord does not like it. Because when you start thinking that you're better than someone else, human history continues to show, and sometimes even in the church it shows, that we treat each other despicably just to make ourselves feel better. Now, I don't understand how you can feel better by treating someone worse. History continues to show that we treat others like they're throwaways or untouchables just to make ourselves feel superior. A, you know, I, there's individuals who are sitting here in the congregation and some of you who are joining us online and some of you who are watching uh, this via streaming, you can, you already know this. There are some individuals in this body who are more visible than others. They are very, very visible. Why? Because they, they come up on the platform or because they serve in some kind of capacity and so everyone sees their face or knows their name. But then there are others who are not quite as visible. Uh, many of you sitting in the pews or sitting at home don't feel quite as visible. And then there are others who actually are invisible. So, what is it that makes you feel invisible? Well, some of you want to be invisible. So you really don't want anyone to talk to you. You want to come or you want to watch, but you don't want others to really get to know you. Now, you might be sitting here because sitting here wanting to remain invisible because you're, you don't want anyone to know what you're struggling with, what mistake you've made or sins you've committed. You don't want anyone to know your shame. And so you're hoping that no one asks you too many questions. There may be some of you who don't, who you don't want anyone to know who you have been or what you've done. And then there are others who have been mistreated and misused and abused and wounded. And so you're afraid to trust anymore. And so you don't want to let people get too close to you. And so you're fine just coming and hearing and singing. And, and, but you want people to keep their distance from you because you don't trust anymore. God does not want you to remain invisible. Then you may be sitting next to someone who actually doesn't want to be invisible, but feel, but you feel invisible. And why is that? Well, it may be simply because when you walked in, no one greeted you because no one smiled or acknowledged you. No one shook your, shook your hand. Or if someone did shake your hand, you are, you're hurt, maybe a little offended because when you looked into the mirror of their eyes, you did not see someone who really wanted to know who you were or how you were doing. So when, the, when someone shook your hand and said, how are you this morning? They didn't really want to hear your answer. Or the only answer they wanted to hear was fine or I'm blessed. Or maybe they shook your hand and you noticed that when they turned from you, you were much more enthusiastic when you shook the hand of the next person that obviously you really liked, that you really preferred. 
And so it made you feel invisible. That happens too often in our bodies. To be loved, to be cared about, to be to be acknowledged is like a balm of Gilead. It can help you heal from wounds. It can help you begin to see that, oh my gosh, if this person who I'm just meeting here in this congregation can acknowledge me, then maybe God truly does acknowledge me as well. If this person can see who I am, then maybe God can truly see who I am as well and love me. Love me for me. You know, sometimes some of us are treated differently because of skin color. Some of us are treated differently because of the acne and blemishes on our skin or the scars that we, were, that we wear from life. Sometimes it's because of where we're from and how we sound because of where we're from. We speak with a drawl or we say Washington <laughs> or we say Spokane and, they, and people realize, oh, you're not from here. Sometimes it's because of our waist size. Sometimes it's because of our shoe size. Sometimes it's because of our bust size. Sometimes it's because we didn't just walk in, we walked in with a cane or because we walked in with a walker or a wheelchair. We get treated differently. If this is you this morning, do you feel invisible? Do you feel like you've been pushed out from the center or not allowed into the, completely into the circle? Because I believe God wants you to be in the circle. About eight years ago, I coached a, a young man, a 19-year-old named Riley Luan Pakti, a Cambodian-American. He was kind of butterscotch color too, by the way. And he, I coached him on doing a TEDx Snow Owl Library's talk on a word called Sonder. And that word was about his discovery that, and his astonishment to discover that other people's lives were just as real and vivid as his own. That other people were really alive and not just characters in his story. And, you know, I would encourage you, if you ever get an opportunity and have interest, go to YouTube or go to TED.com or TEDx Snow All Libraries and look for Riley Luampakti and his talk on Sonder, S-O-N-D-E-R. I moderated a conversation earlier this year between our lieutenant governor for Washington State, Denny Heck, who is a Democrat, and State Senator Ron Muzal, who is a Republican. And it was put on by a group called Civility First. And Civility First is a group that, that really believes that through civility, we can bridge our differences, our political differences and social differences and, and things so that we can 
be at peace with one, we can work effectively and live effectively with one another by simply being nice and respectful and even don't have to agree, but just learn how to agree, disagree agreeably and take the time to listen to one another. So in this, um, in this event, I led a conversation between the two of them uh, on their political differences and how they've been able to bridge those political differences over time. Well, how to keep their, their friendship going, even though they disagree significantly on a number of things. And State Senator Mazal said that there were two things that he saw as really important in their friendship. One was that they had to work to find things that they had in common and celebrate those, those. And then he said, we have to be careful not to become infected by a contagious set of social viruses. He called them the Zation viruses, Zation viruses. And in those Zation viruses, generalization, marginalization, depersonalization, demonization, the first virus essentially takes individuals and lumps them into different groups. And then you essentially judge that group based upon stereotypes. That second virus keeps those individuals out of your circle and keeps them in that group. And so you then treat them a different way you, like, I don't have to listen to you because you're in that group. I don't have to care about you because you're in that group. In the third, with the third virus, it dehumanizes those who are in that group or those groups. So you must not be quite as human as me. You're not quite as worthy as I am. And so I can, I can think of you as someone who's beneath me. And then the fourth virus, when it infects you, you essentially begin to demonize and that, that group. And you think, okay, if you're part of that group, you're, you're, you're not just wrong, especially when, if it's political. You're not just wrong, but you're evil. And horrible things happen when people get placed in that group. When we generalize and stereotype one another, we're showing a bias and prejudice that spits into the face of God. When we marginalize and dehumanize others, we are biased against them. And we treat them in ways that do not please the Lord. And we are essentially, wound, essentially throwing dirt into the wounds of Jesus, the wounds that he bore on Calvary. You know, I think that God has to help us when we turn our backs on one another, and we end up having people who are friendless at turning point. Who feel unloved at turning point. God help us. God help us. If we're not being transformed by the renewing of our minds, we are conforming ourselves to the world. If we're not being transformed by the renewing of our hearts, we are conforming ourselves to the prejudices of this world. We are conforming ourselves to the biases of this world. We are wounding our own. If we're not working to conciliate, to reconcile, we are rebelling 
against the heart of God and the heart of Christ and those he came to save. In John, the 10th chapter, 11th verse, Jesus states, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And I love it that the songwriter in Psalms, in the 79th chapter, 13th verse, stated, but we, your people, the sheep of your pasture, will give thanks to you forever. From generation to generation, we will recount your praise. You know, we are his sheep. We are his people. We are his, his, his peeps. So, who are your peeps this morning? Are your peeps, did you come to church with your peeps? Are you sitting with your peeps? What about, oh, sometimes they call them your faves. So on, on your phone, is there a list of faves? So are you sitting with your faves or is a, is a person in front of you or behind you, or are they one of your peeps, one of your faves? You know, I have a brother-in-law from the Lower East Side of New York City. He said it was rough. And he said that where he was from, everyone distrusted everyone. Especially anyone who wasn't from the neighborhood or who wasn't from your side of the street. Didn't matter about skin color. It didn't even really matter where you were from other than you were the wrong side of the street and you didn't belong on their side of the street. He said they hated everyone equally. You know, this thing about peeps is, is a pretty big deal because we tend to keep to our peeps. We tend to flock and fly with our peeps. We tend to go to dinner after church with our peeps. We tend to sit with them. We tend to get to know them. We pray with them. We share concerns with them. And they tend to be the ones that we like and prefer. So when I was 10 years old, my family moved from England to Jackson, Mississippi. And this was during the Jim Crow era. Now, even though all of the people in the neighborhood where we lived were butterscotch or darker, my family were newcomers. And we, and what made it worse was we kids all spoke with British accents. So even though we looked like those we lived with, we were the ones who were the outsiders and they laughed at us and kept us as a them. Until we figured out how to sound more like our neighbors. Slow down our speech and started to learn how to drawl. Behind my house was a high fence. And that fence was meant to separate us from the folks on the other side. Now, the folks on the other side were much lighter than the folks on my side. Some of them were peachy. Some of them were lily. Some of them were redneck. 
But come to think of it, some of them were almost butterscotch because they were out in the sun a lot and they, they tanned. But we, were, but we were not supposed to go to the other side, on that other side of the fence. They kept us, but we were supposed to stay on our side and we were not allowed on the other. It took me a while to establish peeps from either side of that fence. So there's likely someone sitting near you who feel like they're on the wrong side of the fence, of your fence. Is there enough of God's love in you to tear down that fence? Or you cross the fence to their side and become a good Sam or a good Samantha. So you probably know this story. Jesus tells a story about a guy who is heading down from Jerusalem and he gets robbed and beaten up and left for dead on the side of the road. And a couple of his peeps walk by. A couple of his peeps walk by. And you know, they're from, probably from his circle. That's the, oh, God has made me holier than anyone else circle. They're part of the in, the in crowd. And they, they see him lying there, and what do they do? They cross to the other side of the road. They don't want to get involved. They don't want to have to touch this, this icky situation. But then Jesus in the story talks about Good Sam. So Good Sam is not part of the in crowd. He's not part of their circle. He has probably been despised. He has probably been hurt. He has probably been insulted. He has probably been put down and maligned. And yet he crosses to the wounded man's side of the street. You ever done that? Have you ever crossed to one side of the street or the other? You ever been You ever been in the situation where you watched others cross to the other side of the street when you needed them to come to your side and help you on the side of the road? Jesus doesn't tell us the man's name, but that's why I'm calling him Good Sam. Sam or Samantha. Thinking that each one of us has an opportunity to be that for someone. You know, sometimes, and the wonderful thing about this story is the person who was not part of the circle comes to the aid of the, of the other one who probably had felt more privileged, who probably had felt that he was better. And he was the one who received help. And that's the thing about life that I continue to find good you think you are, you will discover that you're not as good as you thought you were. No matter how well off you think you are, you are never insulated from the things that can happen to you completely. And you suddenly find yourself needing to receive the mercy or the help of someone else. Every one of us in here at some point has needed a good Sam or you will need a good Sam. And Jesus tells us, go be like Sam. <laughs> go be that kind of neighbor. 
fancy that. You know, there is one flock, there is one shepherd, there is one circle. In John 10th chapter and 16th verse, Jesus says, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, so there will be one flock, one shepherd. And then he says in John, the 13th chapter, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another. Not because I've, I've got the biggest cross around my neck. Not because I have a really vivid colored t-shirt with a verse on it, not because I have the fish on the back of my, a sticker on the back of my vehicle, it's by this all will know that you are my disciples. So question, how will they know? How will they know? Just love? Love, 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 love. I just love. Is it just love or love one another? If we have love for one another. So what kind of love is he talking about? Lovey-dovey love? Uh, I'll be your friend if you're my friend? Love? Or the good, good Sam kind of love? The good Sam kind of love. In one of the materials I was reading, it said that love is the most, is the most often used and most misused word in every language. Are you one of the good Sams or good Samanthas in this place? Can someone who has hurt, someone who's been wounded, someone who has been raped, someone who has been marginalized, treated like a, 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 like a nobody, like a thing to be used and tossed away, can they come to you? and receive that kind of love? Will you care? You can't just talk it. We must walk it. We can't simply say we love. We must show we care. Too many individuals at the marriage altar have said the words love only to wake up the next day or a week later or, or at some point and realize, oh my gosh, I don't think this person really loves me. Much more than wonderful words and much more than virtue signaling Love is something you have to walk out. It requires hard work, hard choices, sacrificial giving of yourself. It is inconvenient. My wife has been married to me for 40, 44 years, right, honey? 44 years. She can tell you how inconvenient it is sometimes. How sacrificial it is at times. And that you have to set aside your comfort. You have to set aside your preference. 
And the good news is that it's hard, (laughs) but it's worth it. And the good news of the gospel is that sometimes, well, the good news was that our comfort and our preferences were ugly. Were so ugly that God had to send his own son as a sacrifice to redeem us to himself. So sometimes my comfort level takes me into an ugly place. And it's love that rescues me from that place. Sacrificial love. So I wonder if we can think about what he did for us on Calvary is the kind of thing that I can do for you. Can I love you? Can I care for you that much? Can I have his heart and the spiritual power that comes to me through the Holy Spirit and, trans- and, and let that transform me so that I can step forward and show up? Not just talk it, but actually show up. You know, who are the people in your life who love you, who truly love you? They are the ones who show up when you need them. Who come when you call. Who notice when you're not there. And then reach out to check to see how you're doing. Sometimes we have to set aside our comfort, and choose to give ourselves sacrificially. That We have to provide, step out and provide supportive care. We have to be, and are called to be attentive when we'd rather pay attention to something else. We are called to be kind when we're not feeling it. We are called to be merciful when we don't really want to give that. We're called to forgive when, oh my gosh, I'm just done with you. So that kind of love, when you insert that into what Jesus was saying, into that passage, by this all people will know that you are my disciples. If you step outside your comfort zone, if you choose to give it yourself sacrificially, if you're attentive, if you're kind, if you're merciful, if you're willing to forgive, if you're willing to invest yourself, and that's how they'll know. That's how they'll know. Oh my gosh. I love the Ken Harvey unofficial translation of that. But it is convicting. It is challenging. It is challenging because it forces me to break open the circle of my life. It challenges me because I want to have my circle. I want My flesh wants to have my turning point circle, the circle of those that I sit with versus the circle of those who sit outside, the circle of those who I'd like to run with versus those I don't want to have too close to me. The circle of those I love versus those I won't love. See, this is not just about skin color. This is about having the heart of God for those who are wounded, for those who are hurt, for those who've been misused, for those who've been abused, for those who've been maligned, for those who've been kept out, for those who've been put down, for those who've been set aside. God is calling for us to open up our hearts to be as wide open as his is so that the circle of our lives includes all of those he's calling to be part of his bride.
because what we're going to discover is when the trumpet sounds, there will be those of every nation, of every tribe, of every blood, of every color, of every age, of every bus size, of every waist size, of every shoe size, of every hair length, those who are blessed with baldness and those who are cursed with long hair. Everyone will be around the throne of God. Who is in your circle? Who does God want in your circle? He wants everyone in your circle who is part of his circle. The multi-ethnic, the multi-racial, the multicultural, the multi-social, the multi-generational bride of Christ. Will you open up your hearts today and let the Holy Spirit give you that love that draws others not only to him, but to you? Don't just tell me you care. Show me. Don't just tell me you love me. Show me. And let's walk together. And let's rise together. And let's be part of his bride together. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, O oh God of wonders and all majesties, we want to be with you around your throne. Help us to love, O oh God, as the sheep of your pasture, the way that you have loved us. Continue to work the knots out of us, O oh Lord. Enlarge our hearts so we may widen our circles to include all of those you died for and for all who you are redeeming. Help me, O oh God, welcome others into my life so that when I'm with you one day as part of that multicolored bride, multicultured bride, multi-languaged bride, I know that I will be at home. Help me not support Satan's agenda to keep us divided, to keep us wounding each other, to keep us distracted. Please give me your heart and help me be a conciliator and truly care for those who walk alongside me from every walk of life, from every culture, from every class, of every color, so that the world can see what sacrificial love and caring love really looks like and feels like. So that they can see an evidence that you are real. So that they can see evidence that you are real and we pray this in your marvelous wonderful beautiful name of Jesus amen and amen God bless you all